Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Sermon, I'm an alcoholic. Well, my sobriety date is October 3rd, 2003. Um, I have a sponsor. Uh, I don't have sponsees right now, but I do service. Never Try never to say no to AA, because when I got here, they didn't say no to me. And um, what happened was, um, I don't believe I was born alcoholic. I hear that a lot. Like, oh, I think you're just born alcoholic. And um, I don't know, I just think it's the circumstances people are put in sometimes. At least this was my situation. You know, um, my family and friends used to drink a lot, so I thought it was a social norm. You know, my neighbors um, just sell a lot of drugs. There was a lot of stuff going on in my community, you know. Um, I had a lot of bad role models, so um, that's what I thought was normal. That's what I was supposed to do. You know, school would tell me, say no to drugs, right? And I was raised Catholic, so um, I was afraid to go to hell. And, um, and I just wanted to fit in, you know. I just wanted to be a part of, you know. I felt like I was not good looking. I, I didn't have girlfriends. I wasn't good at sports. I wasn't good at dancing. But um, when I started to use drugs and alcohol, I felt a part of, I felt like I could do all that, you know, I can, it was my social lubricant, you know, and, um, I wasn't very good at it in the beginning, because if I was born alcoholic, I'm sure I'd be slamming a 40 with no repercussions, but I was slamming 32s and 40s, of, um, King Cobra, um, Mickey's beer, and throwing up, drinking, I mean, smoking also a lot of Mexican brick weed, yeah. green mechs, you know, Stuff would get you spinning and you just throw up. And I kept trying to do it, you know. It's like I kept building up my tolerance, you know, just to keep trying to fit in. Because I would, cause I would be sick, but I would see how everybody else would be enjoying themselves. And I wasn't comfortable in my own skin, you know. I had a lot of um, obstacles growing up, you know. Uh, I grew up Mexican. <laughs> Mexican American, so that was an obstacle, you know. Um, you know, my neighborhood was bad. My family worked in the agriculture as um, laborers, and um, you know, I didn't look up to my family. I looked up to the gangsters in my neighborhood because they used to walk around proud, you know, um, and they. I could see that they were proud, and I wanted to be feel proud. So I I embraced all that, and um, around high school, you know, I was like a gang member. You know, I was just hanging out with them because you know there was alcohol and there was drugs, and there was um, friends, there was a community, and um, high school was fun. I had a great time in high school. Um, I, I wasn't weird. I, I am weird, but, you know, I had a, I had fun in high school, you know. I, um, but I was introduced to so many drugs. There was a lot, I got introduced to crank, different colors of crank, um, a lot of white blotter acid. I think I took acid over 20 times, and um, it was fun. I don't regret doing it, not not at all. You know, I wish I could still keep doing it because it was fun. It felt good. It made me feel good. But, um, you know, my disease kept progressing. It was my higher power. I wasn't, um, you know, I, I no longer believed in God. Or if I did, I put him to the side. And, um, you know, I had no ambitions and no goals. I, I didn't want to go to school, graduate, you know, get A's and B's and go to college, you know, I didn't want to eat, I didn't want to date girls, I just wanted to be in my circles and keep consuming alcohol and drugs, and um, if I didn't have it in the morning, I wouldn't eat, 
I'd be in a bad mood. I'd be throwing temper tantrums. I'd be angry. Um, sometimes if I wouldn't consume, I, I remember I wouldn't be able to go to sleep for like two or three days at a time. And when I'd finally consume, I'd, the jitters and everything would go away. And um, this is me like in high school. This is me like in my early 19, my, my late teens. And um, it was like Groundhog Day, same episode every day. Nothing changed. It's just my disease just got stronger and stronger, and I um, kept going under. My self esteem was shot. I had, um, I had, I was done, and um, I didn't know my father was in an AA, and um, he he was able to twelve step me, but he dropped me off in a program, and a program did study AA. And they used to take us to meetings. They used to um, they used to show us how to um, be regular people. I used to have to get up in the morning, eat my breakfast, make my bed, shit shower, and leave, and go get a job, and come back for the meeting and pay my rent. And this is stuff I I wouldn't do on my own. I didn't know how to do that. I was when I got here, I was twenty three. And I was still living at home. I was a mama's boy. Um, a little sad, you know. But um, the program, the SLE actually helped me, you know, catapult into life to be a grown-up. And I started adulting. I started, then after that, I started going to AA because um, I didn't want to suffer that life anymore. I didn't want to be, I, ha- I felt like I had low self-esteem now. So my self, my self esteem was building from no self esteem, and um, now I was having ambitions. I wanted to live. I wanted to be a part of. Um, AA was great as a young guy. Um, it still is great today. Um, the only thing is, um, my disease does work. It keeps popping up. It's never going to go away, and. Um, it does, it does its push-ups, you know, and I got to do my spiritual push-ups. And I've been sober 14 years, and um, it's not been an easy ride. You know, I've, I've, done, I've, I've grown up in AA. You know, I got to do a lot of things I didn't think I was going to be able to do. I was able to go to the club all through my 20s. I just caught up with a friend the other day. He's still sober. We were in the club every Friday and Saturday, just being <coughs> club dots or bops or whatever they call them we were just i had fun in sobriety the young people circuit helped me a lot you know i was able to be in relationships with women and i i'm still learning to be in relationships with people you know i um i'm trusted at my job stuff that i was not trustworthy person i was a thief i would rob your whole house i would, you know i went to jail for a residential burglary and it was it was embarrassing, you know, but um, that's where my disease took me. I was a thief in the night, and um, now, um, you know, when I said that um, I wish I I could still consume and stuff, I sometimes wish I could. But the point of the matter is, I know where my disease takes me, and I got honest with myself that I lost my privileges. You know, I, I really, and, t- and living sober, it talks about when we usually do the third step before we do the first step. You know, I always had an emergency, God, please, God, get me out of this one. But this time, like, I really got honest with myself on him. I'm like, hey, you know, this is it. I can't do it no more. And when I did that, when I really got honest with myself, I was able to um, embrace AA. I was able to sit down and put my pride aside and say, I'm Herman, I'm an alcoholic and a drug addict. And, um, you know, it's a beautiful ride. So if you're new, um, keep coming back until it starts to click. You know, um, because I I, I was sitting there for six months, and I at six months, I I barely started catching on. I'm like, oh, what the, you know, like my brain turned on six months after. So I was so fucked up, you know, Man, I was a, I was a, I was a walking garbage can. Now I'm just a dressed up garbage can. <laughs> so thank you.
turn the meeting over to Njobe. Oh, yeah. wow. Okay, I have to stand up. Yeah. My name is Njobe, and I am a grateful recovered alcoholic. Welcome to the newcomers, you know. Uh, and thank you all for being here for another day of my sobriety. Thank you, Nikki, for asking me to share. And thank you, Eric, for having me. Can everybody hear me back there? Seems kind of, you can hear me all right? Okay, great. Um, well, I guess I'm sticking with the format since I have so much time. <laughs> so, uh, well, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what it was like, what happened and what it's like now. And I don't know, I'm going to ask my higher power to come in here and, and guide me through this. You know, I say I'm a recovered alcoholic, not to separate me from anyone else, but one of the first things that my sponsor pointed out to me, the first sponsor I had, well, she pointed out quite a few things, but she was very clear, and she would have me read them. She would read it, and she would, we would read it together, and then she'd have me read it on my own. So it would be like three times I read it. And, she, and it says, the forward to the first edition, it says, we of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. And then it goes on to say, to show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. You know, and uh, that really hit me. Like, recovered? Like, I was, uh, I came in here. only because I flatlined in a hospital. I had did one of those numbers. I did a geographic, um, well, now that I see, I, what I did was I did a geographic. I got into a relationship. I started a business, and I became a workaholic. And I put down the drink. You know, maybe that was sufficient reason, as the big book says, for me to stop drinking for some time. But it says for some time. And that's exactly what happened to me. I ended up coming back to... Uh, San Francisco, the Bay Area, and, um, you know, I had a glass of wine. I didn't drink wine anyway, you know, and it, it, I had no, like the big book talks about, I had no, uh, no consciousness about the last time I drank and what it did and did other outside things. I, it didn't even phase me. It was a glass of wine. And I had one glass of wine, it was fine. I didn't really care for it, but it was fine, you know? And then, I don't know, somewhere down the road, it could have been a week, it could have been a month, I can't really remember. But I had more wine, and, and, and it wasn't enough. I had to have a bottle of wine, but that wasn't enough. And I had to have two bottles of wine, and that wasn't enough, so I had to go back to hard liquor, because it would get me where I wanted to get quick. And, you know, that's what I was about. I wanted to go into oblivion quickly. I was not the one to get loaded and go to the clubs and be like, hey, like, I wanted to leave this world, you know. Uh, I grew up in San Francisco. Uh, I came from a big family. Um, there's nine of There was nine of us all together. My sister was also in this program, and she passed away sober, a recovered alcoholic of cancer about four years ago. Um, you know, I'm the second to the youngest, and uh, my father's firstborn, so my mother got remarried. And uh, I had a good life. You know, my parents got me pretty much everything. We had what we wanted. You know, we we came from that kind of a uh, my my people my fa my mother and father were from the south, so their idea of raising children was to make sure they had the best of everything. You know, the emotional thing wasn't too much. You know, all the hugs and kisses wasn't really about how our family was, but you know that was fine. You know, uh, but I'll tell you, early on. I was always the director, when I think about it. I was always the director of the show. So I hung out with these two kids, and we called ourselves the Three Musketeers, right? And they were two guys, you know, and I was the only female. And, you know, we got into trouble. We triple dog dared each other, and we did stuff, you know? Uh, and, you know, I didn't know that I was the ringleader until, no, I really didn't know. I thought we all had to come to some kind of agreement. That was my story until I, you know, finally came, at, after so many years, came back with the Three Musketeers or one of the Three Musketeers again, and he was telling me a story. And I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, you were always the one to get us in trouble. We, we used to get our asses whipped for you, you know? So, you know, and now that I think about it, I did. I used to get them in a lot of trouble. But, you know, uh, you know, I always wanted to be somebody else. 
you know, uh, and I didn't know that until I got into that fourth step. And, you know, for the newcomers, when I start talking about steps, you know, just take the part that, that you could understand. Cause some of it just was crazy for me when I first came in here, but I didn't realize a lot of, I didn't realize a lot about myself until I got into writing, you know, about what I, is I thought, you know, and looking at my part. Right. Um, but yeah, uh, my mom used to, you know, I had a lot of nicknames growing up. And in my community, if you don't have a nickname, nobody loves you. So I had a lot of nicknames. And my mom used to call me Pig. And when I was young, she and she said this pretty much almost all my life. You know, Pig, you're a strange breed of cat. And what she was really trying to say is, you got alcoholic thinking. But she didn't know that. I'm, I'm, she didn't know that that's what it was, you know. Um, because I, I thought differently than everybody else. You know, I got resentments, you know, at a young age. You know, I would shut down, cut you off, cuss you out. You know, a little thing, you know. Um, you know, the more I'm in this program, the more clear I become about the reality of my life, of my story, right? Of the past, right? Um, but yeah, I started using it at a young age. My parents got divorced, and when they got divorced, I kind of, we got split up. I never went back to my house. My father picked me up from school and picked up my youngest sister, and we moved to Daly City. And he's like, this is our house. I was like, what? Where is everybody, you know? And that was my introduction into, like, the family has gotten divorced. And uh, and from that point on, I kind of, like, I, I was really resentful. I hated myself. I hated my family. I hated everything, you know? But I really wanted to get out of this world. And, like, you know, I, I can think way back, you know, my imaginary life was a big part of my life when I was young because it would take me out of the world. And then from there, I would get into books because it would take me, you know, futuristic stuff, take me out of the world, you know. And uh, so when my parents got divorced and, you know, someone introduced me to, to cigarettes and it was like, yeah, well, this is cool, you know. It makes me, I don't know, it took me somewhere else. And then, of course, came other things, outside issues. Uh, and I think when I was about, I think I probably started drinking, drinking when I was about 14, you know, and uh, I liked it, and I got sick, and I didn't care. I wanted to do it again. You know what I mean? It was like my body rejected it, and I didn't care. I liked the feeling, and I wanted to do it again as much as possible. And, you know, growing up in San Francisco, you know, by the way, I'm, I'm 55 years old. So growing up in San Francisco back then, I could write a note. And, you know, and say, or I can say, you know, my mom and dad, you know, or my mom wants a pack of these cigarettes, a bottle of this and a six pack of that. And then we shoot off to, you know, the basketball court or wherever and get drunk and loaded, you know, and that worked really well, you know, and, and I never got caught doing that, you know. Um, and hence, that was my life. Looking back on it, I can say I was a full blown alcoholic by 10th grade. No doubt. Um, I didn't care about anything at that point uh, other than just. <clears throat> getting out of high school, skating by, and getting drunk and loaded as I can. You know, first it was just Friday, Saturdays, then it was Friday, Saturday, Sunday, it was Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and then it was all, it was, and we, you know, we had the crew before school. we go around the corner, do what we did, and then went, went, went to class, you know. And it was crazy because I went to a high school that only had 400 people, so there was only 100 people in my class. Everybody knew I was loaded, and I smelled like I was loaded, you know, so... uh you know, and, and that was my story, you know, and, and that was my life. And, and I couldn't understand why I would get these great jobs, you know, and I, you know, I'd get the car and I'd, I'd get to this and I'd get to that and then I'd lose it all. Uh, or, you know, I, I couldn't show up for work and I get fired, but I get another job and I try to do everything I saw everybody else doing, but I was never successful. I could never follow the game plan, whatever the game, it never occurred to me that drinking and trying to live life for this alcohol, this alcohol couldn't, it, it just didn't work. You know what I mean? The drinking part, it was like, I had to drink. I had to drink because I had to deal with my resentments. I had to deal with you people. I had to deal with my bosses. I had to deal with my family, all nine of them, you know, and my mom and my father, you know, it was, it was crazy. Uh, you know, so like I said, you know, I, I, I ended up, getting dry, got a good job, and, you know, I turned 30. I'm going to stop doing this stuff. I'm grown now, you know. 30 is a big age, you know. <laughs> I'm going to do some stuff now. And I got a great job, and I loved it. And the beautiful thing about this job is they let me work as many hours as I want. 
I could work 18 hours a day if I wanted to. It was great. I'd work, 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 go straight home, do the mission as fast as I could, go home, get in bed, go to sleep, get up, go straight to work, you know, because the mission was, you know, certain areas in the area I lived in, you know, I had to walk through a lot of outside issues, you know, to get home, you know? and I just didn't want to stop, so head down, straight forward, you know, and, um, you know, and I did that, and I ended up doing a geographic, moving to Tucson, and, you know, and I, and I got in a relationship, and I really loved her, too, you know, uh, but I was selfish and self-centered and didn't know it. You know, I thought I was doing everything for her, but she didn't see it that way. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so I started this business and we made a lot of, and we made good money, you know, and, uh, you know, we lived well, you know, but I couldn't, I couldn't be a part of anybody else's life. I didn't know how to have relationships. Uh, I didn't have any friends and I had this partner that looking back on it now, I had for my own personal use, you know, it was kind of like, yes, make my dinner. Great. Yes. Let's have sex. Yes. Yes. I don't want to be around you. I'm going to work. And that was really the whole thing, you know, and, uh, I didn't really know how to show love because I didn't love myself. You know, and uh, I was full of a lot of resentments of like the way in the past. I would sit there at work and I'd be working and my head would just be going with, you know, what I should have said and, you know, what I ought to do and just, just, just absolute madness. And deep down inside, I knew I was, I was crazy. You know, I had actually diagnosed myself. You know, I was either bipolar or schizophrenic, but I wasn't going to let the world know. So, you know, I had a business, I dressed good, I had some nice, sweet cars, you know, and I just knew I was crazy, but I didn't want the world to know, you know, and so I put on this front and I was miserable inside, you know, and I didn't get relief and we broke up and shit went crazy and I, you know, dry alcoholic all over her and, uh, <laughs> You know, when I came back to the Bay Area, I got out of Tucson and came back to the Bay Area to be around my folks, you know, and, uh, you know, like I said, I drank and I continued to drink, you know what I mean? And, and it got to the point where I, I lost everything and I, and I was homeless, you know, and, and I did a lot of things out there while I was homeless. And, you know, I love women, but, you know, I, I was slept with men because they had money and I needed to get drunk and I needed to get loaded. I stole you know what I mean? I did whatever I had to do. Broke in cars. I hate to see it now when I see people's glass all over. I'm just like, oh, God, you know what Because I used to do that shit. You know what I mean? Um, and, you know, finally I ended up meeting somebody and basically conned him into thinking I was going to be his girlfriend. <laughs> you, no, I did, you know. And, 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 and I swear this happened, you know, this is this is like, this is almost like the, the famous lesbian story, right? It's kind of like you meet a woman on Monday and you guys are moving in by Saturday, right? And it was like that with us. He's like, oh, come on, you should move in with me. Like, wonderful. He goes off to work, had a good job. He came home. I moved from his bedroom to the second bedroom, and I'm like, I'm not sleeping in your bed, you know. <laughs> this is awful, you know. Yeah, and I just used the man because, you know, he had a good job. He had money, you know. And I, the only thing I was concerned with was, was drinking. I was selfish and self-centered, and, and, and I stepped on the toes of all the people around me, you know. And, and that was that was just basically my story. And, you know, he lived across the street from a liquor store, you know, uh, he would pull up, I'd look out the window, I'd go across in the morning, get everything I needed, and I'd barricade myself up, and I'd drink into oblivion. And I'd come to, and I'd drink into oblivion. And I'd come to, and that was my, and I kept doing that. And I can't tell you how long I did that for. You know, and then finally I got sick and tired, and I thought, oh, you know what? I need to do something with my life, you know? If I just get busy again like before, I could stop like I did last time, you know, and that was my whole thing. Every day, I would write a list of all the stuff I'd do, so I'd stop, and every day, first thing in the morning, I'd drink, and that was the end of that list, you know, and uh, so I ended up putting myself in Laney College. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll go to school, I'll get busy, get my mind going, and I, you know, I won't have time to drink, you know, and that worked good for a whole year, for a whole year, and then I went, and I went and had lunch, I had a burrito, <laughs> I came back drunk. <laughs> I don't even know how it happened.
and it was a beautiful day. I sat at the lake. I had a burrito. I don't even know what happened. All the thing I remember, I remember going back to the liquor store, but I don't remember what I bought. It had to have been a bottle, you know, because I went into a blackout. I remember going back to class. I remember being really excited because I love this class. And then I remember waking up in the morning. I had got on the bark, went to San Francisco, all the way to Hunter's Point, knocked on my sister's door. She put me in on the couch, and I woke up, and she was cussing me out. You know, and I was like, wow. And I looked down at my clothes. I must have fell God knows how many times. It was filthy. Like, I could tell I fell on my knees. I fell on my arm. Like, I don't know how I made it, you know. That was God, you know. Anything could have happened to me, you know. Uh, but, you know, I had made this decision that, you know, I got to stop. And I don't know how, you know. And I was on the bus, you know, and uh, I was going to the doctors. Well, actually, let me back up because I missed a big part of it. So I'm living with this guy and I'm doing his back and, you know, drinking every day, every day, every day. You know, and every day he's leaving money on the table, leaving money on the table, and I'm drinking it up, you know. And uh, so I was hungry, and I told him I love burritos, I love Mexican food. So I told him, I, you know, let's go get some food after he got off work. I said, what you want? I said, a burrito down at my favorite spot over there on Fruitvale, right? Uh, MacArthur and Fruitvale. And so <clears throat> just so happens he came around the way that we would have to go, like, kind of past Highland. Some kind of way on that little back street, whatever it's called. And he said that I said to him, take me to the hospital. Something's wrong with my heart. I don't remember any of that. Um, I woke up with a uh, tube down my throat and everything beeping around me. Uh, I couldn't talk. I didn't know what was happening. Uh, the doctors or a doctor was talking to me in such a way that he was pissed at me. Like he was like, you know. Do you know what's going on? You know, do you, like he was, I just remember him like just seriously scolding me. Like, I don't know. I didn't know what had happened. And uh, later on, I found out that my kidney fell, my liver fell. My heart was so badly damaged that they didn't really want to work on me. You know, I had flat line and they brought me back. And once they brought me back and they ran the test and it was like, well, this is a hopeless alcoholic. You know, it's going to cost millions to fix this body. We really don't want to do it. And like I said, I got a big family. So they descended on the hospital. He called <laughs> He called my sister, my oldest sister. He looked at my phone, and he called my oldest sister, and she called the troops. And I don't know, it must have been about 20 black folk up there talking about, oh, you're going to work on her. You know, you, you're going to work on her. And, and, and that's what they did. And uh, I was so resentful and ungrateful and uh they asked me before they brought me into the operating room they asked me do you want a priest to come my sister must told them we, we were uh uh baptized Catholic. do you want a priest to come in here and give you a last rite and, you know and i said some really choice words that they can do with themselves and that priest and i didn't care if i died you know what i mean i really didn't care at that moment i was ready to go you know i was tired and i didn't see that there was a solution i didn't understand there was a solution i had tried and i had tried and i had did it once i stayed in the past i had did it once i stayed in the past i i should be at i should ought to could have be able to do it now and I, and I couldn't you know and uh so they they worked on me you know and uh they told me when they get my prognosis uh there's a high probability you'll be in a wheelchair for the rest of your life a high probability that you'll be on dialysis for the rest of your life. And there's an even higher probability that you'll have to carry around an oxygen tank for the rest of your life. And uh, the grace of my higher power, none of that has come true. Uh, I'm walking, I'm breathing, I'm talking. Uh, the, re the way I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, <laughs> so, I, you know, going back to school, I'm gonna stop this craziness. I got a second chance at life, you know, and I ended up drunk again. You know, and uh, sitting on the bus, and I'm, I'm, I'm white-knuckling it because I got to go to the doctor's, and I can't drink this morning. 
She can't smell my breath, right? <laughs> I was probably reeking like through my pores, but that was my thinking, right? And uh, I heard these people on the back of the bus, and they were talking about a particular program and how they're so this, and they think they know that, and they don't know Jack, and I, I'm not going back, and, and I'm just ear hustling, and it's a program, <laughs> a program for alcoholics. What the hell is this? So after that, after I got done with the hospital, with the doctors, I stopped at my liquor store, got what I needed, and then I got got on the phone and I said, hey, you know, I, I heard you guys deal with folks, basically whatever, like me, and, and I want to, what, what, what can I do? How could I be there? And they were like, well, we got an apartment for you to live in. I was like, ooh, I could move out of here. I like, all right. <laughs> you know, and all these, you know, things. And they were like, well, can you come on down today? I was like, oh, well, I can't really make it today. <laughs> you know, and I, I don't know, you know, I don't know. It took me probably maybe a couple of weeks. They made me, they made me go up to uh, Cherry Hilton, Cherry Hill first. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> that's what we call the Cherry Hill. <laughs> and uh, so I got, you know, I got, I got dry up there, and then I went on down, and I think I lasted a few months, and then I drank again. And uh, you know, and I, and, and it was only because I wouldn't surrender because I knew too much. You can't tell me to do this, and I think this yoga's stupid, and that's dumb, and why can't I smoke, and blah, you know. And you know, I was, you know, I just wanted to do it my way, and uh. So I came back and I said, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. You know, please, I, I really want to do this. I can't do this no more. I'm tired. They said, come on. And it took me till the weekend. I was drunk again, goddamn. And they said, okay, you got to go back to Cherry Hill or you, or you got to, you know, you got to get somewhere. Okay, I'll go to Cherry Hill. I told them, I'm ready. You know, I just, I need, just give me the chance, right? I went to Cherry Hill. She said, the woman there, she said, call me, you know, when it's time, you know, I don't know how many days, whatever. Call me. And we'll come pick you up. And I was calling, calling, and nobody calling me back. And finally she called and said, we don't want you. And I said, holy shit, what am I going to do? You know? I ended up, a long story short, in San Francisco in lockdown. And that's what it was. It was a not a treatment center. It was a place where they locked you down. Uh, on this side, there had people that were going to AA meetings and that were trying to get sober. And down the hall, they had people in what they called harm reduction. So they were coming in drunk, loaded, and smelling like all kinds of good stuff, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, and that's where I really got introduced to AA, you know. And uh, I was really angry. I sat in the back, and I didn't want to be a part of this thing. I just didn't want to drink no more. And one thing I heard you all say was get a sponsor, take the steps. You know, so that's what I did. Like my first couple of weeks, I, I was there, I got a sponsor, and I had this woman take me through the steps, and she would come, like, so often, I can't even tell you, and she would read this book to me, and she told me, you know what I mean? She read a lot in this book, and one of the things she read to me, she said, I want you to really hear this. She says, uh, of alcoholics who came to AA and really tried, 50% got sober at once and remained that way. I said, what? She said, then another 25% sobered up after some relapses. I said, what? She said, you got a 75% chance of never picking up another drink or drug. And right then and there, I felt like a little bit of hope. 75, that's a damn good chance. And then she said, you know, and among the remainder, those that stayed on with AA showed improvement, Right. So she took me through the first step. She says, you know, are you ready? Are You know, uh, have you admitted, you know, you're, you're powerless, you know, that you're an alcoholic? I said, yeah. She said, you know, are you willing to believe in a higher power? I said, oh, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> she said, well, don't worry about it. Let's move on. You know, are you willing to turn that over? I don't know. Just don't worry about it. She said, I want you to start in this inventory right, right away. You know, she gave me these sheets. She said, put it down there. And I, I was crying and I'm relive in the past and I called her up she says you know this is not meant to be a morbid you know this is a fact finding situation you're just taking stock of what you did you know what you who it is why you're pissed off at them and then you know why you're pissed and what's your part have you ever done this to somebody else uh, yes 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 <laughs> and then what's the fear behind that fear of not being lovable fear of being rejected fear all this stuff came up right um you know, and so we did that, and I sat down with that fist up with her. This was the first time in my life, and this is the first relationship in my life that I was completely honest. Nobody else, you know, at that time knew me 
right? They knew versions of what I wanted to appear to, to you know, I wanted to be the actor, you know, and uh, and I told her everything, and I swear, I swear, I felt a hot rod come out of my spine. I used to walk around like this all the time, and all of a sudden, I just, I just rose up, you know what I mean? And that was God doing for me what I couldn't do for myself, you know. We did, we, we, did, we went on, I took the sixth and the seventh step, I did exactly what she told me to do, you know. And then the eighth step with the, 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 the uh, made a list of all the people we had harmed and became willing to make amends. I made that list on my fourth step. So I just transferred over those names and we went through them together. Do you really owe this person amends, you know what I mean? And, we put, and she said, now, she said, immediately, you go out there and you start. I was like, like, when? Like tomorrow? Like tomorrow you start making your amends. You take these three people and you go. You make appointments and you start doing it right away. Take the three easiest people first and warm up into it, right? And I said, well, I don't know about these people. I don't know where they are. She goes, are you willing to do it if you saw them? I said, yeah, I'm willing. So she made these little cards. She said, don't you ever say sorry. You are making amends, right? You ask them, what is it that I could do to make this right? Right? And then you didn't close your mouth. Is there anything that you want to tell me? Shut up. And listen, I, whatever it is, the good, the bad, the ugly, let them say it. I get free, right? I didn't know that. Scared as hell. I was happy, though, because there was a couple of people in there I knew I'd never see again. You know? <laughs> I was like, I don't never want to see them, you know, because I had did some terrible things to them, you know, and it just so happened. One of the people, I was... uh coming out of the bathroom at Laney College. And there she was. Holy yeah. shit. I went right back in the bathroom. I'm <laughs> looking in the mirror. I'm like, fuck, fuck, fuck. I got my cards with me. I pulled my cards out. What am I saying? What am I saying? What am I saying? You got to do this. You got to do this. I was like, something. God said, if you don't get your ass out there, she's going to be gone. And I went out there and I made amends. You know what I mean? And she gave me the warmest hug ever. This is a person. I went into a... a the, the only violent blackout I ever had, I had with her. I went to a, a blackout and I was violent. You know, I had a fear for her life with me, right? And I had to make that amends, right? And um, and I'm so grateful that God gave me that opportunity because it sat in my head. It just spun and it spun. And after I made that amend, it doesn't spin anymore. It has quieted in my brain. And that's what the amends did for me. It quieted my brain. All those stories I kept reliving and retelling it. How I was going to handle it this time. And how I was going to confront him that time. And what I was going to... All that shit just went, right? Um, you know, 10, 11, and 12. One of the things she asked me, my sponsor, my first sponsor, she said, in the beginning, are you willing to be a sponsor? After you take these steps. And I said, well, I'm willing to do whatever you tell me to do. She said, good. So when I got to the 12 steps, she said, go on and find yourself a sponsor. I was like, find a sponsor? Yeah, start raising your hand. You know what I mean? And uh, that's what I did. I've taken a lot of people partially through the steps. <laughs> <laughs> they bailed on me during the 4th, the 4th, the 5th, or at the at the ninth, right? Um but I, I have uh, four people, two people that have been with me the longest time, five years, six years, and uh, the length of my sobriety, and five, four years. And the other ones are relatively new, two more. So those are the four people I sponsor. Um, God, is, God is good, you know. Uh, I went back to school, like I said, and, uh, you know, and I decided to go all the way up from an AA to a master's degree. Um God is good to me. Uh, I'm so grateful. Uh, what's it like today? Uh, I, so I work at a, I work at this uh, at the college level, and um, working an administrative side. Um, it's really interesting. It's a new job, so I'm working for two different departments. One department I'm really digging. The other department, you know, I don't know. Uh, it's interesting. God put me there for a reason. This I know, and this is a tough journey, and I I can almost in my gut I almost know why I'm in that position, and everything inside of me says run, you know what I mean. I can't be her sponsor, or I can't be like you know what I mean. I can't talk to her as I talk to a sponsor. She's my you know superior, 
But that's what she, I feel like that's where we could really connect and, and, and have a real conversation. Um, so I pray to God every, every day, every night, and I ask him to use me, you know, and I ask him, you know, let me be helpful, you know, let me bring the spirit of your light and your love into my job every day, you know, uh, let me be a contributor. Uh, it's difficult, you know, uh, but there's purpose in it. I don't know what it is right now. You know, uh, I remember I used to say, why me, God? Why? Why does this happen to me? You know, and you know, and what I've come to believe it, it this experience that I'm having, uh, getting to know my higher power, getting to know God. And it is an experience more than the knowledge of, I, I don't have knowledge of God's will for me. I, I wish I did. It would be so much easier. It's an experience, right? I know that when I'm, when my day goes easy and my life is just flowing, I know I'm in God's will. And the minute things start getting like, uh, uh, a little rickety, a little tough, I know that I, I, I'm taking over. I got to be taken over. And I got to pull back and say, okay, what is it that I need to do? Is this something I need to do? I need to pray or do I need to just stop? Just stop trying to do whatever it is I'm doing and just wait, you know. Uh, it is an experience. Uh, you know, I just want to say, you know, uh, this program has taken a, an alcoholic of the hopeless variety who had to flatline in a, in a hospital and be brought back from death uh, into a life that, you know, I, I can't even say it's beyond my wildest dreams because I could have never dreamt this. You know, uh, I just try to walk forward and just be open to whatever that experience God would have me be a part of or give, you know, it's about giving. Now my whole life has been about taking. Now I just ask God to let me be the person or be that entity that can give right. Uh, for whatever time I have left on this earth, you know, uh, cause I'm not supposed to be here, you know, uh, at least not in this condition where I'm able to help others. Right. Um, to the newcomers, you know, uh, please, you know, take the steps as honestly as you can. You know, I've gone through them more than once, you know, and every time something else is revealed, you know, uh, this, this, this program is about spirituality. And the longer I'm here, I'm realizing that this is about my journey into God or growing into God or growing or taking a, away from these parts of myself so I could get closer to my creator, right? So that I could be of maximum service. Um, please take the steps. You don't have to drink again. At the minimum, you have a 75% chance. At the minimum. Okay, and uh, thank you all for being here for another day of my sobriety. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.